This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. And we are back with an amazing guest this week, perhaps one of our most requested guests. I get people asking me all the time to interview her and people sending me press clippings, articles, saying, when will you interview B.D. Deutsch? And the irony is that I actually know B.D. quite well. I've known her for many years in my capacity as a Jewish outreach professional, and she is very involved in that world, has been for some time. And we've worked together on different projects and just sort of occupied the same general orbit. So I, I know B.D. and I have been waiting for quite a while to have this conversation. And thankfully, we finally were able to steal away an hour to do it. She's got five kids, and she was able to peel herself away while they were enjoying log but Umer bonfires and popsicles to have this discussion, which is really, really intriguing, unique, and inspiring. And we're very, very excited to bring an aspiring Olympian and also a very committed Jew who's done a lot for the Jewish people in her young 30 years. Just a quick note, it's very, very helpful, first of all, for you to subscribe. Uh, hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to this, you know, Apple Podcasts or any other platform. And also to please spread the word and let others know to subscribe as well. That would be a great service for us and for the Jews You Should Know podcast experience. And now to our conversation with the marathon mother, Bidi Deutsch. We are here with Bidi Deutsch, marathon runner, Jewish educator, perhaps known now as the fastest woman in Israel. And we'll get to that. Uh, how are you, Bidi? Doing great. Baruch Hashem. Amazing. So you're straight from, according to the news at least that I've read, straight back from Riga, Latvia. Is that correct? Yep. I just raced there on Sunday, flew back Sunday night, and dove right back into work and laundry. <laughs> Amazing. And what, from what I understand, you won that race. Yes. I, I won my first international race, and I got to break the tape, which was really amazing because here in Israel, I've won like a few races, but they don't put up tape for women. Oh, man. It's really exciting. <laughs> I've heard of breaking through the glass ceiling, but this is, a, I guess, a similar sort of sentiment. It's <laughs> just a different material. Yeah. Very cool. So, BD, take it from the top. Where are you from, obviously, for – well, not obviously, but for those uh, listening out there, this is one of those unusual interviews where I actually know the, uh, the subject – in different contexts myself, and BD has been a really valuable personality within the broader Jewish outreach world of which I am a part. But take us from the top and tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your family, where you're from. Um, so I grew up mostly in New Jersey. I went to high school in the city. I came to Israel the year after high school and studied for a year and really fell in love and stayed in Israel. Um, met my husband the year later and we both wanted to live in Israel. So I've been living here for almost for nine years um, and minus two years, which we spent in Tucson, Arizona, working on a college campus with Jewish students. Awesome. So now early on, was your family observant? Did you, what, what was kind of their background? My parents actually became observant and more involved with their Judaism when I was one years old. So I grew up my whole life going to religious schools and I always told them it was the best decision because like I didn't have to make any choice, but I was extremely grateful to have all the meaning and tradition in my life already. What precipitated their transformation? I think having me, they wanted to, they were, you know, now parents, they're like, okay, we got to join a synagogue and they were checking out different options and nothing really, they didn't really connect with any of it. They kind of felt like the reform and conservative synagogues were very church-like. So my father was actually at work one day. He, they, they were in um, the DC area. My parents lived in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Nice. Um, and he met someone, he was, he was doing research at the NIH and he met someone with a kippah on. So he said like, can you tell me something about Judaism? He taught him ethics of the fathers and the whole chain of transmission. And my father came home and told my mom, 
okay, I've solved our synagogue problem. We're becoming Orthodox. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and your mom that. just celebrated at that moment. <laughs> she was a little <laughs> flipping out, but then basically slowly it was a process and uh, they are, you know, so grateful for every, all the changes they made in their life. Is your father still in touch with this uh, NIH doctor? Um, yeah, actually. They're a really amazing family, the Mons. You probably oh, know Dr. That. Jimmy Mond. Okay. Unbelievable. They are a pillar of the Silver Spring community, and uh, their oldest son, Nehemia, runs the social services agency, basically, in our, in our area, with an unbelievable array of different services for people, uh, kosher food pantry, clothing, loans, and just a lot of different services um, that all volunteer. And it's named in memory of their son, Arye, uh, Yehuda Arye, who passed away, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 years ago, something like that. So that's a really uh, incredible family. And like I said, real stalwarts of the Silver Spring community. And it uh, looks like they've done a lot of good for your family as well. Yeah, my parents love that community. For the three years they were there. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so anyway, you unfortunately had to grow up in New Jersey, but you know, not, no childhood can be perfect, I guess. And you came, you came to Israel. Did you... Uh, you said you fell in love. Did you know right away when you were studying in Israel that you wanted to come back and you know make Aliyah one day? Um, I actually really did know that I wanted to live in Israel because my parents invested a lot. I grew up through high school coming to Israel for all the holidays. So I was like really interested and knew, knew how amazing it was. And it was very comfortable to me. It didn't feel like foreign. I think a lot of people have a hard time making Aliyah because Moving to Israel is not easy. I always tell people, like, you can't expect to have the comforts of America if you're coming to Israel. So, but I knew kind of before I got here what I was getting, and I, like, wanted that really badly. So I was, I was ready to stay from the second I landed in seminary. Wow. So say a little bit more about that. What do, what do you mean when you say that you're not going to get America in Israel? Is it, is it just the material standards? And what exactly is different for people? There are so many things that are different, but... First of all, yeah, material standards, which for me was a really big plus. Like, I love having a simple life. The level of what's available and what people, you see that people are just much more focused on the real priorities of life. Even someone who's not religious, like, is tuned into spirituality, I feel. I Like, I live in a three-bedroom apartment. There's less stuff to worry about. For me, that was, that was an ideal. Um, but it can take time to get used to, especially, like, you know, the stores don't have a lot of products you might be used to. There's no, like, easy convenience things. Um, Israelis in general, their personality, they're much more, like, brusque and upfront and bold. With you. Like, Americans are all friendly and how can we help you? Like, there's no customer service here. And But at the end of the day, you won't find, like, a country of people that love you so much and care about you and are your brothers and sisters through everything as much as Israel. Like, there's nothing like that. Why didn't you stay right away after high school? Oh, no, I, I came to seminary and I stayed. Why didn't you stay long-term at that point? Well, I did. I, can't, I, I spent the year, the second, the year after seminary, I was actually a um, dorm counselor in another seminary. And that year I met my husband. And wow. we got married and stayed in Israel. <laughs> Incredible. So you did stay for quite a while, um, yeah. which is amazing. And how old were you when you got married, just to give people some shock? I was 19, yeah. Kind but of 19 now. going on 30. <laughs> I don't know. I was so clueless about life, for real. <laughs> I'm having my big 30 this year, and like, I feel like it, I've learned and matured so much in the 10 years of my marriage, definitely. Incredible. It's interesting getting married young, you know. Sometimes they say it's easier to just take the plunge and do it and learn on the fly. Do you, do you advocate that, or would you uh, tell people to wait a little longer? I mean, I think it's different for every person. I think personally... No one should feel rushed. To, there should be no pressure to rush into marriage. And I don't regret what I did at all, but there might have been things that I could have developed or done myself that I never had the chance to do. I also had a baby right away. So I got settled into the responsibilities of life super quickly. But at the same time, I don't believe that being a mother like, has to hold you back either from pursuing things that you care about. So you know, there are pros and cons to both decisions as we'll clearly see in, in a few moments um what bd did you guys do at one point it sounds like you left israel um and you said you went to arizona uh, what was that process like for you and, and why did you decide to do that 
Well, actually, it was not on our radar at all when we got married, and we had never would have thought that we'd end up in Tucson, Arizona. But we made a decision after three and a half years of being in Israel that we really wanted to give back and make an impact um, on the Jewish community in America, which is much less developed. Like in Israel, there are Jewish educators on every corner, and in America, they're few and far in between. So we went to a desert and we decided to try as much as we could, you know, reach out to students, share opportunities to come to Israel, Shabbat dinners. We hosted between like 60 and 100 people every week for Shabbat. It was definitely probably two of the most intense years of my life, but the like connections that I've made, the students that I still keep in touch with to this day and the ability to shape the future of the Jewish people was like incredibly powerful. Like there's nothing like it. It's very poetic that we're talking now because we actually, in my own organization locally in Maryland, we just hired a new couple and that couple came from Arizona. They were at yeah, University yeah, of Arizona. I heard. They're awesome. Anyone who's, who can survive U of A, you can do anything after that, basically. <laughs> so we're very excited to welcome the Sean Bruns very soon to our campus. And uh, I guess there's a good lineage there in, at, uh, in Arizona, go Wildcats. Um, so you left though after two years, even though you, you sounded like you were accomplishing a lot. Was, was that always a fait accompli? Did you always intend to leave? Was it because you needed a, a larger Jewish community for your family? Or did you just, Israel was just the tug pulling you back? What was it that you know, brought you away from Arizona and back to Israel? I think that we always planned to go back to Israel. We never had it in our minds to stay in America. And yeah, my, my oldest was getting older and I want her to be surrounded by like a strong Jewish community, friends her age who share the same values and not have to wonder why we don't celebrate Christmas either. And as soon as it was amazing, like moving back, we had the kindergarten right across the street. They adopted really quickly, picked up Hebrew. We have friends in our building. There's nothing like living in the Harnoff community and it was, yeah. The only thing that was difficult was like not having Target and not having my minivan. But after I got over that little hurdle, then it was like, wow, it's amazing. Neighbors, people, Jews, you know, it was great. Well, Amazon, I think, is starting to encroach into Israel. So oh, soon enough. Maybe, maybe one day, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> they said it's like a, a multi-year process, but they're starting to test the market there. So yeah. uh, you, may, you may get your Target or a Target substitute uh, before you know it. Have the best of both worlds. Now, what did you plan to do when you went to Israel? Did you have a job lined up? Did you, you had been kind of just doing sort of informal Jewish education. And as you mentioned, there's a, a Jewish educator on every corner in Israel. And what were you doing? What was your husband doing? My husband actually went back to the same yeshiva that he started out in. And he was able to return as an educator, which was really nice. Um, and I planned on continuing to stay involved in some way in the Jewish world. I didn't have a job lined up before we got to Israel, but thank God, as soon as we came to Israel, I was able to work for the Olami Foundation, which was really funding our program in Tucson and hundreds of other organizations just like it. And so I could continue to still have an impact on Jewish students, um, perhaps in an even more powerful way, but from the comfort of my house and my computer. <laughs> so obviously I know what Olami is, but maybe tell people, uh, listeners, a little bit about Olami as this kind of umbrella organization that funds and partners with many, many local organizations around the world doing Jewish education and outreach. What did you learn about it? And, uh, and what did you do specifically within that world? So in the past four and a half years that I've been working for Olami, our global like umbrella and brand has like really defined itself in a much more stronger way. And we're able to offer students opportunities that they would not have otherwise had access to, which include, it could be educators on campus, but it could also be online classes so people can access learning from all over the world, vouchers to come to Israel for learning or trips to explore or fellowships like in Spain, I got to go on a trip to Spain and we have programs like all over the world. And I've been able to connect Jews, like if they're, even if you're doing a study abroad program, I've had opportunities to connect students for just a semester with one of our partner organizations in Europe or South America. Um, 
And it's amazing to see how many programs we have running because we're on maybe five continents, right? Or six, <laughs> you know? So I haven't reached Antarctica yet. <laughs> but Olami, both financially and offer and through all the resources and support we offer, can reach like thousands of hundreds of thousands of students and young professionals every year. Awesome. And so what was your specific role or roles uh, over the last five years? I've specifically been involved in follow-up and just making sure that any student who comes through our system at any point, whether it's learning online, meeting with a rabbi, and then moving somewhere else, or doing a trip in Israel, doesn't get lost or fall through the cracks. There's someone holding their hand and they know about every opportunity Olami has and they feel like they can, there's someone there to help them with that. So I've been like guiding people through the process of coming back to Israel and it's really amazing. With social media and the communication we have today, like I've really kept up with so many people. It's awesome. Incredible. Are there any, any stories you can share of cool uh, encounters or experiences where you were able to connect someone to something or stay in touch with someone over periods of time? Yeah, totally. Um, when I first started working, I was literally cold calling people who had been on an Israel trip two years ago and ask them if they wanted to come back to Israel or, you know, go to a program in the city. So I spoke to a guy who was working in New York and he was, you know, typical, busy, you know, young professional. And he really pretty much tuned me out on the phone and said, like, I'll try, which is code for never happening in a million years. So I then sent him an email saying, like, why don't you go check out the program? And I was really honestly so sure that he wasn't checking out the program. But a few months later, I found out that not only did he go to the program, he went to this class in the city. He connected with a rabbi. He loved it so much. He was like, oh, my gosh, this is what I've been missing for two years. And he's like, I got to get back to it. At the end of that year, came to Israel. He is now living in Israel, married to an amazing girl. And we just had them for Shabbat. And he was like, it all started with that phone call. <laughs> And he and I just both couldn't believe it, you know, one phone call, what an impact it can make on someone's life. It's incredible. And, you know, cold calling in general and, and just recruitment more broadly can be daunting. It can be, uh, can be really depressing, to be frank. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to tell me that. <laughs> so, you know, to get those, those gems, those rare stories that, where that effort paid off is really, it's fueling for, you know, it's, it's reinvigorating. Yeah, thank God there's many, many more stories like him. And at the end of the day, I always tell myself, I, I've seen more often than not, you don't have anything to lose. People appreciate knowing you tried, you care about them, you're offering them something. There's nothing that I'm doing that, you know, is hurting someone. It's only to their benefit if they want. Amazing. At some point uh, along the way, you started taking up some hobbies, it seems, uh, and doing some other things. Among them, perhaps, a little bit of jogging, <laughs> maybe we'll call it. A little bit of jogging. Um, <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit about the genesis of the BD Deutsch running story. So three and a half years ago, I was really tired of being out of shape. And I was always naturally an athlete, like athletic. I love sports, but as a mom, who has time for that? Like who works out? You don't have time. It was like the lowest of my priority. And after having four kids in six years, um, I realized like I was so out of shape. Wow. And Just say that again, four kids in six years. So just give us the, the spread on that gaggle of kids there. I have, well, currently I have five, but I have nine, eight, six, four, and two. Thank God. Incredible. I basically came to the realization, like I had to do something I had to change. And the thing I was struggling with was consistency. Like every so often I'd get this like little idea, like, okay, I'm going to go running. But then it would last for like three days. So I told my husband, like, that's it. I'm going to run a marathon. And this was like this clear goal in my mind. And I gave myself four months to train for it. And I didn't know anything about running, but I, I am athletic. So it wasn't like crazy for me. And all I had to do was run four times a week. That didn't seem crazy. Like it wasn't like every day. I picked four days that worked. And also my husband and I started running every Saturday night together, which was like a built-in date night that was free. And we were both came back feeling amazing because exercise does that to you. And it should be noted, by the way, your husband himself, as far as I know from, you know, knowing him a little bit is also athletic and, and into fitness to some degree, right? Yeah, he's super.
super, no, he was exercising always before me. He actually was part of my motivation. He did, I supported him through this 180 mile charity bike ride. And at the end of it, at the end of the summer, I was like, okay, like you had your turn and now this is, I'm doing my thing. So he was really supportive of it. And we both, it's very helpful having a spouse who gets your sports like needs. Cause like anytime my husband wants to go for a bike ride, I'm like, go ahead. If I need to go out for a run, he's totally cool with it. We both appreciate, we can go out together. Sometimes we do ride tandems or we'll run together. So I chose to run the Tel Aviv marathon and I really had no time goal in mind. My goal was just to cross the finish line. But about a month before the marathon, my husband said to me like, you know, you don't want to just cross the finish line. You want to know when you cross the finish line, like you gave it your all. I was like, well, actually, it will be a pretty big deal if I cross the finish line. You know? like, <laughs> I've never done anything close to this in my life because I didn't start with a five or 10K or even half marathon. You didn't build up. You jumped into the deep end. Yeah. So he's now, like, by the way, did you have someone advising you about this? No, I looked online at the Hal Higdon training plan. And it's very simple and straightforward. And I didn't do anything complicated. Like I said, I wasn't trying to go for pace. I didn't know. I didn't even have a, I didn't have a running watch. I would basically go out once a week. I did my own form of a speed workout, which was really basic. It was six repeats of 30 seconds. That's it. 30 seconds as hard as I could go six times and then cool down in between for three and a half minutes. That was my version of interval training, but it was great. And I did a long run every week. I would get build up longer. So a month before he was like, I'm telling you, see what you can do in a half marathon yourself, time yourself. And based on that, I'll give you a prediction for the full. So I listened to him because he does know me pretty well. And I went to Gonsaker and did like 12 laps myself in the park, just seeing how fast I could do it. And I ended up finishing this mock half marathon myself in an hour and 41 minutes. And based on that, he told me, you know, you should, you should be able to do the marathon in three and a half hours. And I literally thought he was nuts. <laughs> when we signed up for the Tel Aviv Marathon, I put down, I didn't think I could do four and a half hours. That's what we put down, four hours and 40 minutes for my estimated finish time. And now he was telling me, try and do it in three and a half hours. And it seemed crazy to say, I'm going to run a distance I've never run before in my life at a pace faster than I've ever run before. Because I was never running, that, that, just, that pace is an eight minute mile for 26.2 miles. But what was amazing, so I decided to push myself out of my comfort zone and take that risk. And with his support, we decided my plan was I was going to run progressively faster every mile. And I followed the plan and stuck with it. And in the end, I finished. I was, at the, I was getting faster and faster. The last miles, I was passing everyone. And I finished in three hours and 27 minutes. Oh, my goodness. A Boston qualifying time before I even knew what that was. <laughs> I'll tell you my marathon story real quick. Just, just so <laughs> I embarrass myself and feel incredibly uh, inadequate. So I had a similar kind of uh, sentiment about I don't know, seven or eight years ago. I felt I was out of shape. I'd always played sports and such. And I said, I was in a, I think a dry cleaners. I, I believe that's what it was. And I saw a pamphlet for the Marine Corps Marathon, which is a really cool marathon in D.C. Yeah, in Virginia. Yeah, D.C., Virginia. So you run through the monuments and, and over the bridge. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot. Why not? And I'd never done any real distance running either. Didn't build up 5K, 10K. I just dove in. But I, I use the Galloway method, which is like a run-walk method. So he, oh. he encourages walking at intervals to allow for greater endurance and so forth. And I never really exceeded, I don't know, 18 or 19 miles on a long run. And I just kind of jumped in and did it. And I did it a lot slower than you did it. <laughs> I think I finished in 17 or 18,000th place, I believe it was. And at about 617 was my time. That's a lot of walking in there. That must have been hard just to do that. I'm telling you, I think the longer you run, the harder it is, you know? So anyway, I was going to say that's where our, our stories kind of start the same with, a, with this like impulsive idea to do a marathon to get back in shape. And then they diverge completely from there <laughs> where you had a great time and kept going. I had a terrible time and stopped. I did a couple right. halves since then, but uh, I haven't become much of a runner. But anyway, <laughs> so you did it. That was I was hooked. I was hooked after. You're hooked. So what about it drew you in? What was, what was so uh, seductive about running? First of all, endorphins are real. I've never not come back from a run feeling good. Sounds like a t-shirt, by the way. I'm like the biggest. But 
So initially, like when I it started out, you know, just as a mom, I, I didn't even realize how badly I needed the time for myself. And running is such an it's like such a great time to just let yourself get out, be alone with you. I do a lot of meditation, even talking to God, um, just clearing my mind. I was probably so much more stressed out and like losing it with my kids because I wasn't taking care of myself in the way I needed. So for that in and of itself was awesome. I like running because I found my own time. Like it was really stressful to have to, it's stressful for me now still if I would have to get to a class or get to a gym at a certain time. When I run, I know whenever I want to go out, I can go out. I can go anywhere and it's my own two feet. But the more I run, the more I see that it's not even, it's beyond just the physical training. It's the mental training that's so incredibly powerful that it gives me strength in all areas of my life. And it has shown me that if there's something I want to accomplish, like my mind is in control and I really, there's, I could do anything I want. There's nothing stopping me. And like, I think at the core, that's why people are so hooked into fitness because there's something about it that translates into all other areas of your life. It's not just about physically pushing yourself. It's so much more than that. Yeah, speak a little bit about the mental aspect because I think that that's very often most daunting. I always think there's, when I'm, when I'm running and I just recently started jogging again a little bit, I find there's three aspects to it. There's the physical in the sense of like your joints and your limbs, like your body's ability, like your, your legs ability to, to, to do it. Then there's the cardio fitness, the, you know, right, your heart's right, ability right, right. to, to yeah. not get totally winded. Yes. Then there's the mental aspect. And yeah. in many cases, that tends to be the most challenging. How have you dealt with that? Were you a person that isn't already kind of predisposed to backing down from challenges? And so this was easier? Or is it something you've really had to work on and develop as you've built endurance and built, you know, your times and so forth? No, I have to say I'm naturally a very mentally strong person. I'm a very disciplined person, so I didn't struggle initially to get out. Like, I think a lot of people, the biggest challenge is just getting out there. Like, you can be so tired at the end of the day and just want to, and it's so easy to just say, I'm tired, I'm going to lay on the couch. If you know that there's something obligating you, which that's why for me, signing up for a race was like, okay, I have a commitment. I must do this to get to where I want to go, you know? So then it was like no option. And once you get your shoes on and go out, it, it feels good. People tell me now, like, well, well, running doesn't feel good for me. Yeah, I feel good after. So, like, then I think you have to find, you have to do something that does feel good for you. Like, you don't have to necessarily run. It could be, there's so many types of exercise and movement that, that can be really enjoyable. So, find something that you enjoy. Obviously, if you have a goal of getting stronger, then part of working is not going to feel good. Also, the misconception, like once you're fast, it doesn't mean that cutting faster comes easier. It comes harder. Like I'm working harder than I ever worked before, but I'm more in tune with my body and my mind. And it's amazing when I do a hard workout, I can feel a difference in the way my body responds just by what I'm thinking in my head. If I go to the place of, oh, I'm tired. I'm, I can't do this. Like, in Hebrew, like low Bali, like I just want to go home right now, like get me off this track, then yeah, I'm going to start slowing down that second. If I, in my mind, I'll either visualize my dream, like I'm going to be breaking the tape of the next race, or I'm just relaxing into it. This feels good. This is everything that I wanted in my life. I'm just going with the flow. My body can handle this. I, a lot of times think I'm like, my strength is from God. And if God's infinite, that there's anything I, I could do anything I want. Like the possibilities are limitless. When I have all those thoughts in my mind, my body responds differently. And everyone is like that. There's obviously, like you said, your aerobic capacity is limited to a certain extent and your joints and whatever, you can work on all those things. But at the end of the day, if your mind, mental game is weak, like you're not going anywhere. Have you found this to be a truism in other areas of life? Yeah, I mean, I sometimes come back, I'll, I'll come back from a track workout, like literally my body's completely depleted, but I'm on a high because I access this realization that like, okay, the next time I'm like so clear in my mind, the next time my kid has a tantrum, like I'm not losing it because if I was able to, to work, to push myself right then, like then of course I can control myself when my children are whining and I just want to yell at them. No, I, we're in control of ourselves. Or it's like, you know, 
there are certain opportunities I have to take and it's like, it could be a risk in a certain way. And, and I remind myself, like when I race, I push myself out of my comfort zone. Why shouldn't I be able to do that now? So take us back to the process. You ran this awesome 327 time in Tel Aviv. What did you decide to do from there? You said, okay, I'm, I'm going, I'm going. No, to, seriously, I, I, I had no high aspirations. I just wanted to continue running. I didn't go into running to like become <laughs> like there was no Olympics on my mind at that point. All was on my mind is let's continue doing this. It feels good. It's great. So then I actually found out at the end of the summer, like a couple months later that I was expecting. So I was like, okay, I feel really good when I run. I'm pregnant, but it's not new for my body. Like, let's keep running and run a marathon pregnant. Um, and the reason I chose to do it was honestly because I knew the only thing that kept me motivated to train was having this goal. And if I didn't have a goal, then as a pregnant person, it's even easier to be like, I'm tired. I can't get out. But I know that like my body needed even more. Like when you're a mother, it's so important to take care of yourself. So um, I continued to train during pregnancy and it was really one of the best decisions I made. Like my labor was smoother. I, my recovery was amazing. I felt good till the day I gave birth. I ran till the day I gave birth. <laughs> and I highly recommend exercise during pregnancy. I don't necessarily think you should run a marathon, but it shouldn't be new to your body. You can if you want to, but everyone should exercise during pregnancy. I will certainly keep that in mind for my next go round. <laughs> what do the doctors think about this? So my father is actually an OBGYN. Oh my goodness gracious! Holiday specialist. So I had his full backing. The doctors in Israel were a little bit wary, but you know, I didn't like let that phase me. If anything would have felt uncomfortable or that I was causing any potential danger, or God forbid, I'd I would not, I would have stopped running right away. You know, at the end of the day, thinking back, like now I'm like, whoa, I can't imagine running pregnant. Like, I don't know how I did it. But I remember after doing the marathon, the truth is that I had like some kind of pain in my foot, either a stress fracture or something else. And that was what made it much more challenging to finish that marathon than the fact that I was pregnant. I was like, oh, running pregnant's no big deal. But <laughs> Injury uh, is the challenge, huh? What was your time in that in that marathon? Which marathon you pregnant? I ran the Tel Aviv marathon in um, February 2017. That was when I was pregnant. My time was four hours and eight minutes. Wow, um, so you really, you really slowed yourself down. Know, yeah. after baby. <laughs> <laughs> and after that... By I, how pregnant were you, by the way? I was seven months pregnant. Seven months. So you were so, And then I ran the half marathon at eight, month, at eight months pregnant. All right, so then where did you go from there? I decided after I gave birth, I gave myself a month off. And then I said, you know what? That's very generous, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I had looked at the times of the Israeli women in the Jerusalem Marathon. And I was like, hey, I could probably win the Jerusalem Marathon if I wanted for Israeli women. Like, not so far off from my time. What was the winning time at, the, at that point? Every year was slightly different, but it seemed to be around 319, 320. Okay. Now, Jerusalem is a much more difficult course than Tel Aviv. Yes. It's extremely hilly. The best runners don't run there because you're not going to get your best time. And it's a lot harder in general. So I decided that this is what I was going to train for. I was still training totally on my own, but I ramped it up by like running five or six times a week and doing more like real speed workouts. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I did workouts. And actually in the buildup to Jerusalem, I discovered I was about a month and a half before the race. I discovered that I was severely anemic. Oh. And I found out that I had celiac disease. So I almost really didn't know if I was going to make it to the start line of the race because like a lot of my training had been compromised and I, I mean, I was running, but I didn't feel, I didn't feel strong. But as soon as I took gluten out of my life, I got much better. <laughs> Baruch Hashem was absorbing everything again. And I really rebounded really quickly. And I did end up finishing the Jerusalem Marathon as the fastest Israeli woman, and I set the course record for Israeli women because I finished in three hours and nine minutes. Now, when you say Israeli women, I assume that means there were international runners that come in. There's a couple Kenyan women every year that come in. <laughs> and at that point, I wasn't competing with them. This year, I did race like with Kenyan women, but um, at that point, I was not, not there yet. Right. Uh -huh. 
so at this point, you won, or at least you finished with the best time for an Israeli woman um, for the non, I guess, and, and the non-professional runners, so to speak. Yeah. Did you realize that, okay, this is something serious. I can, I can jump in and start training. Was there an immediate sense of what to do with this or you weren't quite sure still? Yeah, people were like, join a group, get a coach, like you have real talent. And so it was a little bit overwhelming, but I checked out three different groups in Jerusalem and I found one that made sense. And I decided like, okay, let's see where it goes. Like I'll, I'll actually run with some structure. And I started training with a group and a coach, which was amazing. Like I, ha I give them so much credit for taking me to the next level. And we trained with so much structure and build up and I increased my weekly mileage. Like I didn't realize that it's not just enough to like run five or six times a week. You have to be running a certain amount of volume. And I hadn't been doing that. So that really made a big difference overall. I, I, I loved running with other people that when I did the workouts, it was amazing to have someone pace me and I like people knew, knew what they were doing and what I was supposed to be hitting. So I was really enjoying it. So where did you, like, you found just a random group of people? How did you get a, how did you get this group or this coach? No, I met the people. These were, like, they're a well-established group in, in Jerusalem. They, they were at the track every Tuesday night, and I met them when I was at the track once. And, you know, I spoke to different people in the running. I was slowly making my way into the running world. Like, a lot of people at that point kind of knew me as the winner of the Jerusalem Marathon. It made headlines because I was the first mom of – five and you know woman running in a skirt to like win a race I think <laughs> and I, I always joke about I'm like people were surprised yes you can run in a skirt you can win races in a skirt you can also run if you have kids you know <laughs> that was like a big deal for the world I actually want to drill down on that a little bit on, on all those topics really what was the reaction that you were starting to get obviously you're a visibly religious woman with the skirt and, and hair covering what kind of reaction did you get from people once you started demonstrating real ability was it all positive were there some naysayers um and i guess both in the general world the, the, the general running community and also perhaps in the religious world uh, how did people respond and those are really two very different populations but what were the uh, distinct reactions in each camp so to speak so i have to say that i'm really grateful I, honestly almost all the response I've had has been really positive. For sure, within the running community, I think people love the fact that it's something different and that I'm, I don't, you know, I say when you are confident in your values and what's important to you and you own it and you don't hide it and you're not, you're proud of it, people respect that. That's what people want to say. Like, I'm not in anyone's face or telling anyone else what to do. It's just about something that's important to me. And it gave a lot of inspiration to other women who, who would be running in skirt but might have been embarrassed about it. And now they have nothing to be like, it's like almost like a trend these days. Like everyone's like, if she's winning marathons in skirts, we want to wear them, you know? So from the running community, been extremely, extremely positive. From my, in Israel, it's been really positive in general. Like I have connected with so many Israelis across the spectrum, also Arab Israelis, also other, you know, all types of people, um, and it's running is a bridge for bridge many gaps. Um, and then within my own community, I think it's definitely paving a new path. People aren't used to like religious women going like becoming professional athletes or doing something so in the spotlight. But I'm I'm not about being in the spotlight per se. I'm just about showing that you can be fully adherent to the laws, Jewish laws and halacha and still pursue something that is important to you and you're passionate about. You don't have to compromise. And I'm very careful to consult with my personal mentor, Rabbi Kellerman, who really supported and encouraged me on this path. And he himself is a big runner. He's a big runner, yeah. Did you connect funny, with him before I, or after you started running? I got more connected with him really since I started running, but I always had somewhat of a relationship with him, but like this is much more easy definitely become more stronger so the community in the religious sense is requiring some adaptation or some uh, calibration to sit with with what you're doing and at the same time uh, there are definitely people that are encouraging it and giving you some strong support and backing yeah i mean i would say like in israel things are more black and white so like in the most 
religious community of Israel, it might not be seen as something accepted yet, but I think I'm paving the path for more religious women to pursue sports in a way that's okay. I'm very respectful of my community and I don't run in my community because like people don't appreciate women running in the streets and that's fine with me. I don't need to do that there. I can find, I have plenty of other parks and paths to find that are comfortable for me to run at. Um, so it's always about finding the right balance, you know? <laughs> Have a lot of women come forth and come forward and said, hey, you know, you've inspired me to start running or hundreds of people. But the best thing for me that I heard was after I, this year, um, when I was at the, I did the Jerusalem half marathon this year. And so many people came up to me and told me, like, because of all your posts and everything you've shared, we started talking to Hashem while we're running. And like, we never would have done that before. And I think it's just because so natural to me like when I'm in a like I I talk to God all throughout my races like I'm having one-on-one conversation and like I speak about it openly and I didn't even realize it was something that people might not have thought about like to me it's just part of who I am so I'm when I heard that that was like the most that's the most that made me the most happy of all my accomplishments and you know like that that feels winning for me well well, that's a real integrated approach because what you're saying is I think that you know, there's not body and soul. Now you're servicing your body and exercising and then prayer is for the soul. You're really fusing the two and the body work becomes soul work at the same time. A hundred percent. It's one pack. They both need taken care of. Um, they're not, you know, you can't have one without the other. But it's really important to me. Like people ask me at this point now, you know, I'm pursuing the goal of trying to represent Israel in the Olympics. And it's like crazy, you know, and I want to show the world that even at the most elite level of athleticism, at the end of the day, like I value my soul like most and like I'm a, I'm a soul over a body. And that's because that's why I choose to dress the way I do when I run. That's the message I'm conveying. So you mentioned Olympics, the big O word. Um, yeah. When was the moment that you said, I can go all the way, I can go to Tokyo and uh, represent Israel, uh, the Jewish people, Jewish homeland, on the world's biggest stage uh, in 2020. When did that even enter your mind as a possibility? Was there a coach that said, hey, BD, you got this? Or was it like you just looked at the times and said, oh, I can, I can reach that? When did that click? And then once it did click, what was that process? Because that must take things to a whole new level. Well, the truth is that I honestly... I'm saying Olympics, but uh, things are complicated. Like I, I, it's not set in stone right yet. Like I have, I don't know if I'm getting there. It's my goal. But I remember basically the crazy thing is like last year when I won the Jerusalem marathon as the fastest Israeli woman, a, a running friend of mine like messaged me like, Beatty, like you should try and qualify for the Olympics like 245. It's not that far off. And I like laughed at her. I'm like, I did a 309. I know what 245 takes. Like, it's a big gap. I'm happy. Yeah. yeah, I was like, no way. I didn't even consider it. But this year, when I won the national championship in the half marathon in December, and it was a great race. It was like pouring rain, and I oh, like gosh. completely blew myself out of like how the time. I cut off the time I was supposed to do. I was shocked, and I felt amazing at the end. And I'm like, hey, like, I could actually probably do a 245 marathon. Like, let's do this. So... It was in my head, but then like some reporter had contacted me and I remember like verbalizing it. Like I want to represent Israel in the Olympics. And it was like really scary to say, cause it was all like, you don't share these huge goals with the world. And then all of a sudden the reporter published it. And it was like on the front page and I hadn't discussed it. Like I was like, ah, this is crazy. Um, but it really came into fruition after I won the national championship marathon. Because then I also completely surprised myself. I had been going in with the goal of, like I said, trying. My coaches wanted me to do 248. In my head, I wanted to try and do 245. And at the end of the day, I ended up doing 242. And my second half was six minutes faster than my first half, which is pretty significant. So after that, the Israeli Olympic Committee reached out to me and said, like, we don't even normally do this. Normally at the beginning of the year in September, we'll determine the funding for the athletes we want to fund. 
but because you did this qualifying time of 242, for them that was a standard the time that you needed to get funding as an Olympic candidate. Because you did 242, we want to fund you. So that was like basically gave me the motivation and ability to train at an even more serious level. So what does it mean when they say they're going to fund you? They, they allow you to hire a coach, to buy equipment. What do you need? They give me a monthly stipend. It's small, so it doesn't, it's not enough to like cover my expenses as a mom of five, but it's something It's nice. Yeah, they cover any like training races. I want to go fly abroad and do races. They cover that. They cover like medical. <laughs> yeah. They sponsor my medical, like, you know, PT. My PTs are my best friends. <laughs> And I, ha I work one-on-one -on -one with a coach now, as opposed to, I was before working in a group, and now I have my own coach. And I was able also to get, I, get spo I got sponsorship. Nike reached out to me in Israel and sponsored me. And I believe in Israel, they call it Nike, right? They, they yeah, Nike. I, know. I think both, yeah. The Israelis can't say Nike for some reason. There's a Nike branch in Israel specifically that, came, that reached out to you? Yeah, yeah it was the Israel branch. Um, it was pretty crazy. I was just like, basically, after Tiberia, we spent Shabbat and Sfat, and we were, and we drove home from Sfat. My phone was like just buzzing off the hook, like reporters and interview, like come to this. Like me and my husband were just laughing. I couldn't handle it. The next day, I went in the morning to do a TV interview. It was my first ever television interview, and it was in Herzliya. They sent a taxi for me, thank God. And I finished the interview and I was in the taxi, like on the way back. And all of a sudden I like see a WhatsApp message, like, hi, it's Yariv from Nike. Give me a call. And I'm thinking like, when Nike contacts you, like you call them right now, you know, <laughs> I called them and they were in Herzliya. And I was like, I told the driver, like, can you turn around for me and just take me right back? And I went to meet them and they said like, you know, we sponsor certain athletes if they've reached a certain level and we want to give you our shoes and clothing and and the only thing is like the only condition you have to like wearing nike i'm like yeah i love wearing nike i just haven't been doing it because it's so expensive so show her i'll take your shoes you know they have the best racing shoes out there. Ah. what about skirts so the skirt is another issue um for now like i i meant i've been trying to bring it up like let's make a because they actually made a huge job i said for the olympics Let's make Let's a nice skirt. Yeah. yeah. So as of now, it's not happening. But I'm not giving up, you know. I, I have in my mind, I haven't found, I've gotten contacted by every running skirt company out there. And they all have different advantages and disadvantages. But I haven't found one that's really perfect for racing. I'm not a fashion designer, but I kind of know what I need at this point. So I'm looking to, to make something that will be performance-oriented running skirt. There we go. Maybe just start your own company. No. <laughs> no <laughs> way. I think that's the last thing I want to do. <laughs> okay. So what does it take from here to, to the Olympics? What's the process? How can you make it happen? What are the steps remaining? Well, until March, everything was really great. And basically, I qualified for the 2016 qualifications. It was 245. And then we thought... You know, there was a big possibility. It's gone back and forth between 237 and 245 for women in the marathon. But in March, the Olympic Committee announced new extreme standards for men and women. They're only taking 80 marathon runners from around the world. Now, every country can only send up to three representatives. So even though Ethiopia and Kenya have hundreds, they have many women that, that could go, like they're going to only be able to send three. But new standard either you can get in with a guaranteed entry if you do a time of 229.30 229. 229.30 now i don't know maybe in my life i might accomplish that but this year i'm not able i'm not going to make a jump right now till 229.30 by may which is the time i have to qualify until but you can also get in through the ranking system because there won't be 80 runners that even meet that time from around the world so the ranking system is very complicated and it's not even about how well you do your time. It's about how well you place Different the points. other runners. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is it's complicated, but then again, that means there's more room for like God to manipulate everything. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I'm running the world and if I'm meant to go, it won't happen. And if I'm not, it also, it won't happen. And I never, it, it wasn't like this is my lifelong dream to go to the Olympics. I'm very comfortable with, 
doing the best I can to try and make it. And at the end of the day, it's up to Hashem. So right now you're traveling to different races around the world in order to get placed and to get sort of ranking points. Is that what's happening? Um, no, I'm not going to be doing so many international races like that. They're, you only, you, they only take your top two races, but I do, will do some more travel races to get practice. But my goal right now, I'm really building a strong, a base of like short distance speed so that when I start training for a marathon, I want to do another fall marathon. I'll be able to have even better speed to work with and, and then do a better marathon time. And we'll go from there. It's, it's a process. But when people ask me what my next goal is, I say I'm investing in the process and I'm planting right now. There's a lot of hard work you have to do and you have to be patient. And I always tell people that like you can't expect with everything in life, but especially a lot with training, like you, you don't always have the results right away. You have to put in the work. It's a lot of, you know, just keep showing up the daily grind and getting through it and slowly you build. And after four months, you could look back and say, wow, I made this huge jump, but it doesn't happen without really being working hard every single day. And a, uh, a year from now is when you would really find out about qualifying. It sounds like. By May 2020, I have to meet the, yes, that will be determined. There are certain races that if I do really well, I would have a guaranteed entry. But then again, the best runners will go to those races. So, you know, I, I don't know. We'll see. I think you can do it, Petey. I'm, I'm in your corner. Thank you. A lot of people are rooting for me. And I believe anything's possible with Hashem's help. So um, I'm going to do the best, give it my best shot. Incredible. What advice do you have for women and for moms who are running and, uh, or just exercising in general? How do you encourage or inspire people? Obviously, most people are not going to become elite runners sponsored by the Israeli government and Nike. <laughs> but, you know, what do you tell people? A few things. First of all, don't compare yourself to anyone else. Running is an individual sport and it's about your own progress. People can get really discouraged when they look at other people. Like, that's with anything in life. Get off of social media if it's doing harm for you. Focus on what you want to accomplish and just keep track of your progress. As a mom, this is for me. I'm really talking to myself. You have to learn to say no to the things that you can't take care of. Like, you can't do it all. No one's a superwoman. And you have to be able to set clear boundaries. Make a list. Like, these are my top three priorities. If anything else is not... If, if there are things that are not guiding me to those goals, then just like take them out of your life. Like for me, my top three priorities, my relationship with God, my family, and right now these goals as a runner, because that's, I am sponsored to do that, to train for that. So if there are people like, you know, I, I, I struggle with this immensely because I love helping everyone. And it doesn't necessarily mean I'm not, I, I don't want to help them. It's just, you have to sometimes put yourself first. And then I say, you cannot live with guilt. Like when I go away for a race, I'm not thinking about all my kids at home. Like I set up a system that they're taken care of really well. My husband's in charge. He's great. And I'm really comfortable and confident with that. And I can go and enjoy myself. If you're constantly, when you go and try and do something for yourself, you're thinking like you're feeling guilty about it. Then you're not going to be able to, you're not going to recharge and give yourself what you need. So don't get rid of mom guilt or you can never, yeah, that guilt is bad. It's not, for, it's not productive. <laughs> um, and that's basically, you know, so I'm very organized with my time. I think about what I want to accomplish and then like look at my day and also give yourself some slack. Like we all have bad days. And at, even in a day where it's like, Oh my gosh, I didn't get this and this and this done. Don't look at it that way. Count the things that you did get done. You'll be surprised if you're a mother probably did a hundred things in your day, you know? Incredible. So. Incredible. All right. Well, BD Deutsch, we're rooting for you. We're looking for uh, this time next year for those listening at, at the re original release time. We're looking forward to seeing great news, but even if not, you know, the, the standard that you set and the mentality shift that you have affected both again in the broader world, the running world, the, the general Jewish press, as well as, even within the religious community, uh, have already been profound. So thank you for that. And thank you for joining us on our program. Thank you so much. People who are interested in following my journey, I'm on Instagram at Marathon Mother and my Facebook page. And I post, you know, updates 
how to get in a strong mental game and just, you know, dealing with life in general, running the marathon of life. <laughs> Beautiful. The marathon mother, BD Deutsch. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews you should know.